So the topic for today's call um, is actually reviving um, a piece of work that was left dormant in about uh, 2018. Um, there we go. Can everyone see the slides? Yep, okay, great. Um, <clears throat> so back in about 2018, Nick and Lee started developing together um, the Opportunity API. So this was uh, a specification for an API that would allow people to query for particular bits of data um, rather than using the RPDE harvesting method, which is currently the only way to really publish opportunity data right now. Um, so um, this is a very different kind of model. Um, the harvester model, as we discussed a little bit last call, places most of the burden on the consumer. So it's difficult for the consumer to consume harvesting uh, uh, harvested data simply because you need to download everything, then query it. Uh, but the trade-off is that it's very easy for the publisher. Um, and we talked a little bit in the last call about the RPDE specification and just how easy it made it to publish uh, RPDE feeds because everything could be cached in a very uh, lightweight and effective way. Um, but simultaneously, that makes the RPDE method of publishing a little bit inflexible in that obviously if you're going to cache it, it can't change very much. Uh, so it doesn't support advanced querying, uh, slicing up the data set in various ways very, very well. Uh, but it does make it easy to maintain a publishing framework. Um, the difficulty, I think, is while we've got opportunity publishers on board in reasonable numbers, um, consumption has been tricky. Um, and I ran into this um, myself working on harvesting, where consuming the entire ecosystem uh, of publishing is extremely heavyweight. Um, it's also a bit vulnerable to irregularities in data, of which of course we have plenty. Um, so I've picked up the uh, 2018 stubs of work on the Opportunity API. And um, I think we should just go through what an Opportunity API uh, would look like and what it would need to do. Um, part of the reason for this timing is a combination of personal pain um, implementing the harvesting model. Um, partly because we've got a long-standing difficulty with uh, a lack of data consumers uh, or potential data consumers complaining that consumption is quite difficult. Um, and then there's also the fact that we'll be getting a feed normalization service delivered in the first couple of weeks of August. Um, so what this work is, if people aren't familiar, is open data services are currently building um, a harvester that goes around to all of the sites listed on the status page, um, harvests it, and then republishes it in a normalized form, which basically means flattening the various hierarchies that are used to represent the data into a, into a flat representation um, of entity types that are bookable. Uh, so it'll be events and slots and that kind of thing that are output. So it is easier to consume the data because the feed normalization service has regularized it to some extent. Um, the purpose of that work is to make it easier for potential data consumers to play around with and to use the data that gets published. Um, it's also going to power an improved status page, which gives a better sense of where data irregularities are and where data value lies. Um, but another advantage of having this big centralized data store of all of the data is that we can in fact, build an API against it. Um, or to put it another way, we need to build some kind of query interface for it to make it easy to use. And given that work was already started in um, a somewhat abortive way earlier on, it makes sense to scaffold that query interface up into something that is actually um, useful as an API specification in future. Um, the use case that this supports is a little bit different. Um, the harvester model is quite good if what you need to do is um, suck down all the data at once and create a big data store of everything that's available. Um, the Opportunity API would be better at uh, 
one-to-one -one integrations or one-to-few integrations as opposed to the entire ecosystem at once. Um, but the data store gives us, uh, the, the feed normalization data store gives us a nice centralized uh, data repository to start playing with and testing out assumptions. Um, I think the question then is, what would the Opportunity API need to do? What are the requirements for that? Um, off the top of my head, it looks as though um, read-only querying is really what it's there for. Um, and if I look at the list of issues, which I've linked here, and I'll just take you to, in fact. Um, Tim, you love a browser tab. What's that? You love yeah, a browser yeah, tab. I can't have enough, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your poor <Fire>. computer. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's nice just to have everything right there. Um, if I if I look at the um, if I look at the issue list that was collected for the Opportunity API uh, a couple of years ago, um, it's pretty much all just querying uh, by different criteria: um, filtering, kind of querying, sorting. So it's basically just ways of getting at the data and presenting it in, in different ways. Um, partial responses, um, that's an issue for not getting complete opportunity records, but just the fields that you particularly want to keep the, the bandwidth minimal. Um, but it's basically, it's a search API. Um, so I was just wondering if Nick had anything to add at this point, because all of those issues were written either by Nick or by Luke, but the bulk of them come from Nick. So is that a fair characterization, Nick, that this is pretty much a search and query um, API as envisaged here? Yeah, that's what's there. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm waiting for the opportune moment to, um, to make a case that Tim knows is coming about this. <laughs> Um, so uh, I don't know if, if Tim now is the is the right time before we get into the detail of this, or um, wh what would be best. Um, I think, yeah, um, I, I think now is fine. I mean, I suppose the question is, under the rubric of requirements, that admits of a range of responses from infinite requirements to actually there is no requirement. Um, so, um, so shoot. Well, actually, no. If you if you could first answer the question as asked, um, which is. You know, is, is this basically a search um, API that's being described here, or is it just that this is a partial representation of, of envisaged functionality? Uh, I guess both. Um, the 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 so so I guess maybe maybe it's helpful to start with background uh, that could be useful here. What, what where this repository came from, what was going on, and then maybe into the kind of now uh, it might be a nice. Um, flow. So um, the Opportunity API, as described here, started out life as, a, um, as an idea that we would, in order to get booking and other things working, we would need to have a way of interrogating in real time some of the opportunities um, in, the, in, the, in the database in a way that wasn't using harvesting. Um, as the booking spec evolved, it became clear that this wasn't a requirement, this wasn't a prerequisite for booking, so we could get away without this building block, if you like, um, and we could move straight to booking. Um, previous versions of the booking spec before 1.0, I think 0.3, relied on this API as a kind of fundamental piece. And so, um, and then I think it was it was um, Lee back then's um, point of strategy was let's focus on getting adoption of the specs we have now rather than creating more specs. And so this was dropped on the basis that we hadn't yet got full adoption of modeling spec across everyone, and we definitely hadn't got the booking spec anywhere near adoption. So rather than trying to get too many people to do things, um, let's focus our attention. And also focus our efforts in terms of technically refining the APIs we already have, um, rather than creating new ones um, that will have to start at the beginning of that cycle. Um, so I guess that's, that's where it, it came from. Um, and I suppose it's the other, the other thing to, um, to note is that this didn't come from, um, it definitely didn't come from, um, anything to do with helping data consumers to do what they need to do for the ecosystem better. 
So this, this, this is not designed as a way of making harvesting easier or solving the harvesting problem. I think it's really, really important to, to note and like properly crystallize that the reason that harvesting is the way this will works is because it needs to work that way. And I think if we don't have that clearly ag agreed, then as a tech, just on a technical level, I think the thing to probably should do is go back to first principles, get a whiteboard and look, look at why harvesting has to exist and is, the, is by far the easiest way for the whole ecosystem, consumers and um, providers, not just for um, providers. And, and it, that has to do with scaling. It has to do with how open source, uh, sorry, open, uh, open data works, not needing to have API keys, reducing the barrier to entry for the ecosystem, a uh, whole bunch of stuff around, around that. And the, the way that the harvesting allows you to do some of the things that, you know, taking subsets of the data and everything else using built-in filtering. Um, so the, the, I, guess, I guess the kind of the model has always been We'll, we'll make both sides as simple as possible, make the consumer and the provider side as simple as possible. And if we need to use a little bit of open source tech, such as the great thing that's being built at the moment, the harvester in the middle, to help people bridge that, that's the best thing to do, rather than increasing the complexity of either side. Because as we've seen, if we increase the complexity of the provider side, that slows everything down and we end up, I mean, Gladstone, we, you know, the big systems have barely implemented what we already have. Um, the small systems can barely afford to implement what we've already asked them to implement. And so with, with it that being that, that the case, that actually it then is really important to minimize the amount of time and effort and cost on those systems. Um, and also with the, the point last week that was made, I think is really important to highlight again, is that that most agile approach to this is harvesting. Because if you make everything available as harvestable data, if you want to change your queries, if you want to change the way you're accessing that data, you can do that really easily in that central piece. And then you can change the way you access hundreds of booking systems just by doing that in one central location. Whereas if we have, and another problem with having the opportunity API is the, the default method or a method um, of interacting with lots of systems is that if you want to change anything, if you want to decide to query by a different parameter or add something new, then that's something that you need to implement everywhere. And so it really slows down the rate of evolution of everything. And so um, I, think, I think there's basically, a, a, my suggestion here is that I think there's a, a really strong technical case to be made for why harvesting is the best approach for the ecosystem overall, for consumers, for providers, for everyone. Um, I think that may be somewhere to start with so we know what kind of problems we're solving with this. Um, and, and I think the, the thing, the reason that's important to understand is because I think a really bad a, a danger here, I really see a danger is if we create this specification and start promoting it to people alongside the existing specifications and give them more work to do, I think we're going to have a real, there's a real risk here that we undermine our efforts to get uptake of booking, to get conformance to the modeling spec, because we'll be busy telling everyone to implement another API when I actually just don't think the demand from consumers is there. I think it, it, it's technically a nice idea, but when you get into the which consumers and like let's name them and talk about them actually want this and they and and they've got challenges with the harvesting model and then let's talk to those consumers and say what are your challenges because all the i mean the harvesting model is old enough now that we've got most of those problems solved and so it really is i think um a case of looking at the real reason we need this and so um from an ecosystem perspective just to separate this out from ecosystem perspective i don't think this is needed i don't think this helps us move anything forward at all However, from having a good open source harvester's point of view, which is what we're focused on, obviously, in the short term, building that, I think there's a huge value in having a well-defined API that's standardized because it's open source and it might as well use something that is standardized. Um, and so I think if we can create this API with the harvester really in mind, and obviously more general thinking around it as well, um, but that, that being what it's really its primary purpose is for, and then crucially, Having got that far, maybe we stop at beta because it's not worth investing a huge amount of energy and getting the whole ecosystem and having another massive meeting with 90 people in it to try and get full consensus on a new spec because that's massive and Open Active hasn't published a brand new spec in years. So rather than going through all of that massive effort for the sake of a very small open source bit of software, I think focusing ourselves on let's create this as a kind of beta thing or whatever it is, like rough thing that we can do for that open source bit of software to make that as useful as possible. And then let's definitely not try and push uptake on this downstream to all of those providers who have barely implemented the things we've already given them. Like that would completely squash progress today, I think. 
So if we can separate this out and, and really focus on the short term objectives of the harvester, I think, rather than getting too caught up and risk the ecosystem over having a much bigger thing here that might distract everybody, especially when people like David at Everyone Active are saying, these specs, people just want to pile in on the ad features all over the place. That's just on the booking spec, let alone a whole new spec. People are getting to the point with this now, they're like, come on, open active. If we're going to be forced to implement all this stuff, there needs to be a limit to this. So I think if you got, if we wanted to get consensus on a new API and you got all 90 people in the room, I think you get unanimous, no, let's stop this crazy stuff. Like we can't put any more in contracts. That's too much. We've barely got we, what we've already got there. So I just, I just to reaffirm, don't think we're going to get consensus on a new API or anything like that from the whole community if we do it properly. I don't think we need to. And I think we should focus on the short term stuff. Is that helpful? No, I'm, I'm glad you say that because we're agreeing with each other. Um, that, yeah, I think, yeah, the purpose of this is to have some kind of sustainable interface to the harvester as it exists and one that's easy to scaffold up into some kind of specification in future. So the intention was not let's get an API ready by March 2021. That would be much, much too much work. Um, but I think it is possible to get a workable beta. Um, and I think it would be useful to consult groups like this in order to make sure that that beta is as useful as possible. Um, no, I wasn't, I wasn't seeing this as like, let's change the entire ecosystem. That said, I think I want to have something that can be plausibly implemented by publishing organizations as well, as well as plausibly consumed. Um, without necessarily having it ratified as a, as a specification. Um, well, I suppose it's just checking that that's from a technical perspective to make sure we've got the technical side sorted and not from a kind of, we're going to engage the engagement side of Open Active and, and try and rally everybody around this from a strategy point of view. It's like, if this is a technical thing, then 100% behind you, you definitely need to make sure we've thought all the angles through because that's the point of making a gener generic specification, whatever it's for. Um, but just kind of really clearly delineating that from strategy and this becoming any massive strategic pillar of anything that we're doing, because I think that's where we, we kind of run into things. Yeah, I mean, I would like to see it become a pillar because I think the, um, I think the difficulty, I think there's difficulties with the harvester model and I think we need to have both. And some of them are technical difficulties in that it's a pain harvesting everything, particularly with the larger feeds. Um, I think there's a problem that developers, I think, tend to assume there's an API, you know, leaving aside RPDE being an API. Um, the assumption of developers going in is that there will be something that looks like an API and there, there isn't one. And therefore you then have to get into a rationale conversation about why there isn't one and so on and so forth. So I think, I think it likely, uh, hold on, hear me out. Um, I, I think it likely that we want complementary structures for accessing open active data in the far flung future. Um, particularly because the harvester model is assuming that what you want to do is gulp down the entire ecosystem, that you want a, you know, pretty much all of it. Um, one to one integrations or one to few integrations. The harvester model is not friendly to that um, and it hinders things like data exploration. So I think in the future, I would like to see a sufficiently mature ecosystem that there's a place for both. In sorry, I, sorry, I was going to say, I just, I think, I think it's really important to dig into those assumptions because I think each one of those, I think there's a good debate to be had about those I think things like developers finding it um, not intuitive that there's no API, um, you know, things like um, that it makes data exploration difficult or things like that it, um, that there's, there's kind of limitations imposed by it, I suppose, because I, I guess, having worked with d different developers on this, I, I totally understand that they're saying, where's the API? The reason they're saying, where's the API is often because they don't understand it's an ecosystem they're plugging into. It's not like, there's not like a single interface they can connect to the whole of Open Active because we're talking about an entire industry's worth of data. And so a lot of people come into this and thinking, oh, the Open Active API, it's a platform, isn't it? You guys are a platform. Well, obviously it's, it's not a platform and that I guess is fundamentally what it, what it isn't. Um, obviously, the, with the, the great harvester tool we have, that will make it easier to access it like it's a platform. And that's where you can say, oh, there's an open source tool you can use like an API if you want one. But I think that's quite different from saying, so there's an API option, you can plug this tool in if you need it. 
that's quite different from saying like you know let's change the the structure like totally change the structure or even you know that, that whole strategic pillar idea i guess is the is the thing it doesn't i think that's where maybe that's that's like a, a point of of like something to kind of really understand where those assumptions are coming from that's leading to it becoming a pillar because i just think i think if we really went through we could literally name all the organizations we've spoken to and exactly what their issues are i think it's just reading them in different ways perhaps and like the same yeah, no i think i think yeah. i think we're agreeing with each other again in a way i think we're looking at two different sides of one coin um in that i think you're right that once you talk developers through the ecosystem idea the fact that we're not a platform the fact that it's an ecosystem change the need for a harvester becomes apparent i think the difficulty is that that funnel gets quite narrow the more the longer that conversation has to go on that i think everyone we engage with and everyone we have those conversations with at length saying and it's an entire ecosystem and here's the big vision and here's how it fits together that's great and we can have those discussions and those arguments really um but people who are not convinced by them or who simply take a look at it and don't really understand how it all fits together disappear um and i think, I think this is the, that might be a good assumption to test sorry that might be a good assumption to test because i think i think the what my reading on this and and from the discussions um i've had as well i think it's the case that it is complicated and people do go well i've got to integrate with the whole ecosystem that's complicated but i think it doesn't matter if it's an api or a whatever if you've got 30 endpoints to integrate with of any type that's going to be complicated and it's going to put people off so i don't think the api is the problem i think the ecosystem being fragmented is the problem and open active fundamentally solves that fragmentation no, but again i think i think the assumption that was latent in what you just said is that well, how are they going to integrate with 30 endpoints, you know, and then of course an API doesn't help you because again, essentially what you're doing then is you're harvesting but via an API rather than a feed model. Right. So yes, if what you're trying to do is harvest, then a harvesting model makes perfect sense. If what you're not trying to do is harvest, if you want to integrate with a small number of publishers, um, if what you're not trying to do is harvest, and what you want to do is, is simply integrate, then a harvester model doesn't make sense. And right now we only support one of those. Uh, so, so I guess my question is which, like what concrete example do we have of a publisher that when really they get into the detail of this, decide they only want to consume one or two feeds? Because generally, even with a sport that's got one main feed, like running, those things exist in our parks, exist in like a number of other feeds because a good, good gym. So every sport we've got, like, whatever way you slice the data if you want it geographically if you want it by sport because of the diversity of the ecosystem you you always end up with more than one feed from every use case i've seen i just i guess i'm really interested in like where's the what's the concrete like i just want to integrate with one system example i think it's not that from what i've heard at least from people it's not that they necessarily only want one feed also sorry my teams is going crazy because there's gonna be like loads of pinging notifications whilst i'm speaking um but it, it's more a case of not knowing what might be in those feeds. I think that's maybe something, and maybe that that's where I maybe I might be coming at this from a completely different and incorrect angle. And that's a, I think, yeah. So that, I think that's very fair, and that's a completely. I think that's a totally different thing. And I know that there's plans to solve up the harvester solves that, and also that the idea we've got about a da dashboard with all the data on it can solve that. Those things are about surfacing the information a bit more clearly, if you like. So it's like the difference between changing the way that we're showing the map of the roads and changing the roads themselves because the, the the infrastructure which is the data infrastructure is the roads that's what we've built with the harvesting model and we've got those roads in place obviously they're expensive to build they've taken a long time to lay down maybe people can't see all the roads so we need a better map and that's what you know having this kpi dashboard will be great there's a map you can go to that road or this road and that one goes faster than that one goes slower um, but at this point saying actually we don't want roads we want tunnels let's dig everything up and like do the tunnels instead or even put tunnels underneath the roads. It's well, you can get there via the roads anyway. And, and no one that I've seen has said, the roads don't work for me because I, you know, it's, it's because, because when you get into the detail of it, that's what they need. Um, I suppose that's the, that's the difference. Do you see what I mean? Sure, I mean, hmm. I think again, it's about how you filter different conversations. So, you know, I've had a fair number of discussions that are like, yeah, maybe I want to integrate with more than one feed, um, but I only am interested in badminton out of those feeds. Um, what's the harvester way of going about that? 
Um, well, I page through all of the data and I write a filter that, that says not badminton, throw it away, uh, mm -hmm. badminton, keep it. Mm -hmm. um, and if I'm trying to harvest, say, a GLL feed, um, let's do this for 36 to 48 hours. Um, well, that's, that, that's, that's different because the GLL feed has got all of time in it. And there's another problem we have with the feeds, which is being addressed and was talked about in the last call, which is making sure you can only extract the useful information from the next right. two Tem weeks. Temporarily, right, yeah. Right, temporarily. And, and that, I think, totally agree with that problem. That definitely can be solved. But I don't, again, know that that needs to be digging up the roads. Do you see what I mean? I think that's, that's a very, like, we've got a point solution to a point problem there. And I think that, that's, that's right. Equally, I think there's a fair number of organizations that would be interested in essentially integrating with their own systems, but in an open way. So you can say, um, you know, I'm publishing all of GLL's data. Um, I would also like to write a little app that only harvests GLL's data. So at the same time that the data is out there in the ecosystem, I want just my particular organization to be represented via an app or something like that. Again, the harvesting model, well, what, what the lack of an API integration right now encourages is that you do that using a private API rather than openly, right? Well, so I think, I think this is, a, okay, so if we really get into that use case, so that is, okay, that's a good use case. So there's GLL who might want to integrate with only GLL and use their own data, right? If this, so that requirement has been there for a very long time. And for those systems that have that requirement, because their customers have that requirement, they already have their own APIs that are built. People have integrations against those APIs. And I suppose most importantly, there's very little value in standards when you're only integrating with one endpoint. So if GLL is only integrating with GLL, what value is there in Legend rewriting that API to match a standard? Because the only one integrator that connects to them doesn't need to see anything different. Oh, because this is part of the value of, there's actually a huge value to that. And in conversations about booking, in fact, this comes up quite a bit, that organizations that are already themselves amalgamating information from a number of parties um, have got a messy internal data harvesting setup um, and are grateful that there is a model already published that they can use. Um, so if you've got a messy internal kind of booking engineered infrastructure, um, and you're already integrating with four or five different people using four or five slightly different booking spe um, de facto specifications that evolved over time, it's actually tremendously helpful um, to be given a unified pattern for dealing with this. That the, the, the standard aspect is actually valuable to organizations because it's a standard and it gives them a template to work against. So I think it's not implausible that that also is true for opportunity data as well. So I suppose it comes back to, you know, who, who's asking for it, what are the use cases, and, and ultimately how does it get more people active? Because I totally get there's an argument for um, st standards are good because they're well designed. Mm -hmm. If you have a standard for something, it probably means that people have thought it through and plugging and, and you know, if you obviously we're, we're standards geeks on this call, right? We love standards. So if we went around and said, what can we standardize in the technical infrastructure of um, the, the sport ecosystem? There's probably a whole bunch of stuff that could be standardized. And I guess it's the question of, is it our job to um, help those organizations that are doing those internal integrations? And is it part of our message? And is it part of our, you know, the things that we're, we're, we're pushing through in, in the contracts, et cetera, to try to get those things to happen? Because I, I can see what, I can see that there's, I get basically the, the challenge I have is that those people don't seem to be the people that would want to connect with open active and get more people active. Oh, no, that, that's, that's the conversation that, that that's how it arises, that there are these large organizations with kind of slightly funny business models, you know, where they harvest thousands of opportunities and then make them available, say, corporately, something like that. Um, so, so what's the example of one of these organizations that might be useful? Uh, I suspect I shouldn't actually. Um, but <laughs> makes it okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I realize it's a bit. I'm, I'm citing unknown, um, unknown authorities. But yeah, people are. There are organizations that are interested um, in um, publishing a significant volume of of opportunity data that they're getting from various sources. Um, 
and our and there's more than one organization I'm thinking of here. Uh, there's precisely two. Um, they harvest data from a variety of sources and then they republish it for selected clients, um, but would be interested in republishing more widely and find value in the standards as giving them a sort of input and output interface. Well, maybe concretely, what value does this add to the ecosystem? Uh, it potentially, it's like adding any other uh, data supplier into the ecosystem. So how would one use- There's a bunch of opportunities. Um, well, I guess I'm just under, I'm just confused at what why doesn't harvesting work for them? Why does opportunities work for them? What's the what's the difference? To, what what why is it fundamentally that they need an opportunity API to make this work for that use case? Uh, they need an opportunity API to work for that use case because they wish to write their own applications against it. So internally, they would republish using it. Um, some of that they would harvest off for their own purposes, for their own clients. And some of it they would divert into the open ecosystem. So, and, and harvesting doesn't work for that because? Uh, harvesting doesn't work for that because it would typically involve a bunch of the organizations that they're pulling data from implementing some kind of standard. Um, so it would either be an API in this case, or it would be a feed. Um, and mind share for APIs is easier than it is for uh, feed models. See, but this just, it, this seems like it's, I mean, that's, that's solving an internal problem for, uh, for, I mean, ultimately they can just, they can externalize the data that they want to publish openly as a feed, right? And that would be fine. There's no reason why they couldn't do that and it would be trivial for them to do so. So what, I, I don't, I still don't understand what problem we're solving. So we're solving a twofold problem. Uh, if you imagine an organization um, that is collecting a bunch of opportunity data, essentially, so it's essentially in the in the I'm in role, um, right. Sure. right? For a bunch of other organizations in a somewhat different ecosystem, right? So it's not the kind of leisure center world that that I'm in is in. It's in a different uh, range. Um, it's it's collecting data from uh, a bunch of organizations. Um, it's reprocessing it and it's and it's publishing it. Um, and right now, say all of those organizations are making their data available in a variety of bespoke formats, and they're losing a lot of time because they have to collect that information. You know, might be uploaded via a spreadsheet, might be other some kind of feed model. However, those organizations are making their data known. That has to be ingested by the I'm in like organization, and then it has to be republished in some way by the I'm in like organization. Okay, so we're saying there's an I'm in like organization that's going to benefit from not using a feed model. Yeah, well, I mean, what, what format does I'm in republish its data in? Oh, so it, it republishes it as a search API. Right. But, right, which is, which is, but that's, but they're not a publisher, I guess. They're a reuser. No, no, they're, they're a republisher. It works in the same kind of way. Um, for both these organizations. So they are refining the data and they're republishing it. Um, the difference is that they then also write their own applications against that republished data, put it that way. Oh yeah, okay, sure. But then- uh, Yeah, like, so if Iman had like an Iman app, for instance, um, if you can imagine that. Sure, yeah, 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 okay. But so, uh, but I think that maybe we're talking about two different things here because if that's about making, so, if there are middlewares that exist other than I'm in, mm -hmm. which there already are, right? And they want to they want to use a standard search API, then it, yeah, completely makes sense. Like middlewares adopting a standard search API. I mean, to be clear, the I'm in guys have contributed in large part to the API we're discussing here. So this is coming from I'm in's original thinking, a lot of it, right? That's where a lot of this, and in fact, the reason it came about was partly because of um, I'm in saying is that something that would be useful and then oh well, does it fit with booking as well so it was all yeah so so that's that's why it exists and that's I uh, sure it being useful in a beta form is the same thing around um, the reason it would be good for a harvester it would be good to have one for those those republishers um, but just to be clear though we wouldn't be saying so let's say there's a there's another I'm in that whoever they are is connecting to a bunch of sources and doing republishing themselves surely we would be telling them to make the data open from those sources. Um, because I guess the challenge if we're not doing that is, 
we're, we're kind of breaking a little bit the open ecosystem that we're, we're in. I mean, that would be the same as I'm in going and collecting a bunch of private feeds themselves that only they have access to and publishing them themselves, which obviously they don't do. And so, I mean, if we want to get into the world of allowing people to have closed access to data and mixing closed data in, and then, uh, yeah, I, I guess, because well, the I mean, whole point of this that, is- That yeah. possibility exists already though, right? I mean, you could also implement a feed model and say, well, nobody knows about the existence of this feed. We're harvesting this, um, you know, privately in accordance with the specification, um, but we're just not making it public. It's not submitted to the status page. I mean, that, you know, that could also happen. There is, there is a difficulty that presumably you would want to have an authorization key of some kind for any API. Um, so it- Well, I, I guess my deeper concern here is that I, I feel like we, the, the principles of open active around making sure all data is open to be published. I, I'm not sure if the scenario outlined there is, is in keeping with those principles. It sounds like what we're, what we're really doing is, is saying, um, to, so, so someone, someone can republish their data from a bunch of closed sources and, and make that data open from, from the, them onwards, right? Which is not. Okay, I'm gonna ask a really stupid question, but maybe it's not stupid, I don't know. Is that kind of what EMD does though? Or is it different because they are, I guess, the, the one true source of that data, like the people, people put in their sessions into Classfinder Direct. Is that how that that's different? So it's, a, it's a great example, right? So with EMD, in order for them to be part of the open active principles that they, they adopted, they had to publish their data openly from source. So currently EMD has three, uh, well, you count book when, although that's kind of moving and, and migrating at the moment, but two to three open data sources, two different booking systems that they have and they pay for themselves and one uh, which is a partner, which is book when. So they have three raw feeds, which anyone can consume. And then EMD Classfinder consumes the data and other data and produces their front end. And so the key thing there is the raw data is the open data. There's no, I mean, what EMD could have done, and I don't think would have been in the, in the principles of Open Active, is said, you know what, we're gonna collect all the data ourselves in, the, in private feeds, and we're going to then publish stuff openly when we want to and not when we don't which then what that does is it gives EMD an advantage over other activity finders because it means that some stuff only goes into EMD and then some stuff goes to everyone. And so the whole point of open active is we're saying that data should be published openly from source. Well, so no, but well, we, these... allow, we allow leisure centers and so on in principle, not to expose some of their stuff as open data, right? I mean, if you've got, you know, the typical business case would be you've got some courses that are underperforming and therefore you expose those as open data and then you've got others that are oversubscribed. And so in principle, you wouldn't publish those. I mean, that's yeah. always been a possibility, right? But it's different to, but that's different from having a, some kind of aggregator anywhere on the internet that's using private data instead of open data and their private data in addition to open data. But then it, it's what we used to call open washing. It's the idea that you say, oh yeah, we're compliant with open active, great. What we've really done is just you know, pulled in, we've just exposed 2% of our data openly, but we're actually pulling in a bunch of private feeds that we're only showing on our front end. I mean, so for example, if, if you take I'm in, if I'm in wanted to go rogue and against open data principles, could integrate with a bunch of systems in a closed way, expose that data only through I'm in to I'm in customers, and then say the only way you can get access to all this extra data is I'm in. You have to use I'm in, otherwise you don't get the data. And, and, and that's what the whole point of Open Active is to avoid that situation where you've got this monopoly on data by making sure the data is open and the ecosystem is open so you don't end up with a situation where you have to use I'm in, otherwise you don't get the data. The, the, the reason people use I'm in or, or any aggregator, right, is so that you can, you can get easier access to the data. But that's very different from the only way because that's where we came from before Open Active. The only way to access certain data was if you had the right agreement with the right person, you shook the right hand at the right meeting, and that's what creates all the friction around innovation. So we wanna be right, really careful. But hold on, program. I mean, doesn't, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't that by a similar token invalidate the booking API? I mean, that's an API model as well, and that depends upon particular contracts, particularly negotiated. Well, so open, open booking isn't open data, and that's partly why the whole, the principles of open booking are, work with as many brokers as you can. The booking systems shouldn't be the gatekeepers to which sellers can work with which brokers. It should be up to the, 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 the people who wanna work. Basically, if you've got like a random yoga instructor, they want their stuff everywhere, right? 
it shouldn't depend on who shook hands with who in the middle as to where that information can end up. And I guess if you take that as the principle and then kind of work backwards, that's where you end up with like the reason we don't want these random data silos and, and closed data. Right, okay. So I feel like two alternatives present themselves. Um, one of them is essentially to say, if you are a company that has private contractual arrangements um, to republish data, um, if you are not publish, if you are not republishing all of your data, you can republish none of it in, with open standards. Um, and this seems to me independent of the question of a harvester, right? I mean, I, again, there's the enforcement of a, an API key, but it seems like you well, can. I guess I'm just. I, th I feel like we're muddying the two things together because if if it seems it seems from what we've said that the only reason that you need anything that isn't a harvester is in scenarios where you've got a lot of private stuff going on, which doesn't oh, matter. No. Um, no, I'm saying that the value for some organizations lies in the fact that it's a standard rather than the fact that it's open. So I mean, there, there, are, really, there are middleware really, publishers who find value in releasing some things as open and in using standards because they're standards. So there's a kind of bifurcation there, absolutely. I guess it depends on the business model of the middle there as well. I think it's probably it's probably it's probably actively not helpful for a middleware to have the stuff to, to standardize their endpoints to match every other middleware, right? Because that means the switching cost is lower. Mm -hmm. That's the business model. So I, I don't I can't see. I guess I'm. I mean, obviously you can't talk about the two examples that you have in your um, that you've you've talked about. But and that's why I think what's making this really difficult because that the tangible nature of those is probably what's going to really make this make sense. Because I think that you know, for me, it feels like there's a, there's a conversation to be had with those guys, which is that if you're contractually obliged to republish some stuff as open data, that's what you've been told, then, then maybe we need to have a conversation about with your, the people that you're talking to, or think you're solving their problem about what this really means. So to take an example, right, an organization like a middleware provider could go around to a lot of organizations tomorrow, like leisure operators and say, we're gonna help you meet the open active standards we're gonna create a way that you can publish your data only through us. And then when you tick this box, your data will go into only us, and then some of it will go onwards. And they're gonna put themselves in a big position of power in the ecosystem by doing that, because they're gonna be sitting in between anyone who wants to use the data and the data source. And so, um, we, you know, that, that could definitely happen tomorrow. I mean, like, you know, I'm in could start doing that tomorrow, right? And, and, and pull in all that data and then, and then say to people, well, you can only access it through us. And, and really clamp down on that. Um, but obviously the problem with that is, like I said, that that is kind of undermining the value of the open ecosystem. So I think a conversation to be had there is, if someone is telling you, whoever you are, contractual anonymous provider, that that this person, this this a middleware can solve your open data problems by making your, by making your data open in this way, but then maybe you've missed Sorry, the what Open Active is doing. So I, I'm worried that this isn't, terribly useful because I, I think again because I'm not comfortable citing such parties um, but I think there's um I think there's some false premises involved there um, I think I I think the number of organizations that perceive themselves as having open data problems is actually fairly low um, I think the organizations don't see themselves as having open data issues. I think the providers are not committed to the idea of open data. Um, I'm just trying to think how to take this on usefully. Um, well, I, I feel like until we can really get into the detail of these assumptions, however we validate them, it's especially difficult when obviously they're anonymous for whatever reason. Um, I think it's, it's really difficult to, to have, is it, because I think, I think the, the, the difficulty here is, right, if we, I think, I, I really do think if we take the wrong road here, we're going to erode what we've built to date. Like I said, I'm in makes one well, different I'm, decision, I'm and I think you can start seeing a very different ecosystem. I'm not saying I'm in word, but I'm saying that if everyone does that and we let that slip, we spend a lot of time trying to reinforce open values in an ecosystem that everyone's looking to try and extract value from, right? And so it's diff it is difficult to hold the open line, but I think it's necessary if we want the bigger, the bigger win here. So I think it's just, it's just really making sure that we don't accidentally undermine our efforts to date by, especially if there's an anonymous scenario we can't fully explain, which doesn't really help me feel comfortable with, 
you know, uh, there's a lot of open good stuff happening over here and there's some anonymous person in the corner that wants to do something to extract value from someone and we don't know who, but let's rewrite our standards for them. Like, I, it feels no, really no, not. No, no, no. I, think, I think this has escalated a bit. So first of all, not a question of rewriting the standards. Um, it's about complementing the existing standards for a variety of use cases. Um, I think your, your concern was how does the ecosystem benefit? And the only reason I dragged other organizations into it was that there are organizations that uh, could conceivably add a, you know, considerably to the number of opportunities available. So that's kind of the concrete benefit. Um, my supposition is that it would be useful to have this option open in future and it would be possible to readily develop a kind of prototype beta um, to illustrate how this might be done going forward. It's not that I want to use this as some sort of way of strategically reorienting the entire uh, open active initiative. Uh, it's about giving another means of access. Um, and, it's, and it's a well-established pattern. I mean, this was on the table as something to be done in 2018. Uh, if I understood you correctly, the only reason it was dropped was because it was not seen as a prerequisite for booking. So all of the principles against this that you enumerated had already been considered and presumably considered to be acceptable. It was just found that it was unnecessary. Well, it's, I think it's quite different though. We weren't, we weren't talking about an alternative to the harvesting model then, and we weren't talking specifically about allowing API keys. This is, see, I think this is the danger here, right? We get into a place where you can legitimately publish open active data behind an API key where you can control who can consume that data. That's what this allows. So is, is, is the issue uh, simply with the API key? That's one of the issues. Okay, right. So, well, so what are the other ones? So the API key is one, um, presumably licensing um, would be. Well, you could, you could, for, I mean, so there's, there's, so there's the API key, there's the, the, the opportunity search spec in itself doesn't scale so uh, because the question is we're forcing the providers to implement or potentially contractually forcing right depending on who we're talking about forcing yeah, no, I, to I, again i think that might be escalating it a bit i mean um making well, if it's a strategic pillar that's my question i guess if it's a strategic pillar that means it's part of something that we're going to be pushing to people to do if it's just a beta like i said at the beginning that's a different story like well up for doing this as a beta exercise. I, know, I guess I guess you spend 40 minutes arguing like a quite a hypothetical point in a way because yeah, I don't see it as a strategic pillar in the sense of creating a roadshow and saying you must build this alongside your feed. Um, I think this is about having a beta and saying here is the model for how you would go about uh, creating that API. Here are the starting points for turning this into a specification. And I, you know, I, I then mistakenly and speculatively, uh, and probably just led us down a path that we shouldn't have gone down, but speculatively, yes, I think this would be a valuable thing to have. Um, and not just for shadow organizations, but because, you know, as a consumer, it's very easy to um, write a client that will query an API and you can take little sips of the data and it's kind of a nice accustomed way to work. Um, it's much more lightweight. So, you know, I think, I think there's a benefit in it. So speculatively, yes, I think this would be very valuable to have as a strategic pillar in open active, but I do not see pursuing that prior to March, 2021 as something that would be prioritized because we just don't have the time. As you say, it is a major effort. Um, I think it's useful to have a kind of template there and have that as an option, but I certainly wouldn't want to make this, um, you know, a resource drain. So I guess the fundamental well, question well for the harvester. That makes sense. So I guess the fundamental question here is people say at the moment there's contractual obligations on people to publish their data according to open standards. That stuff is around making the harvesting stuff, the building in harvesting, so RPDE and the modeling spec, and building in booking, right? Those two things. So just to confirm, we're, we're not saying, hopefully under any circumstances, that someone could tick those contractual boxes by implementing only an opportunity feed, uh, an opportunity API behind an API key and not publishing an open feed. This is like an addition if they yeah, want. So, so Nick, it was, it was only ever you who mentioned the contractual issue and that certainly would not be something that I would look to have 
you know, it would never approach the level of formality. I think to write it into a contract, you have to have, you know, a specification and it has to be a ratified specification. And, and it's clear that we can't get to that point by March 2021. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, uh, it, the idea of writing this into contracts had never entered my mind. Um, and yeah, I certainly, you know, as you say, it would be unrealistic to do so. Um, and I wouldn't, yeah, that's, that's off the table. I mean, I suppose potentially, you know, see what happens in 2021, 2022, you know, other people might take it in that direction, uh, but that's certainly nothing that, that I'm envisaging at all. And, you know, partly because we don't have time. Um, so it sounds like we've got a, uh, um, because it's, because of uh, uh, time limits and, uh, uh, yeah, um, and other constraints. Yeah, it makes sense to focus on the beta stuff. Um, yeah, and, and I think actually, like I said earlier, and I think maybe I just added, I muddied the waters a bit, but I, I think actually we're basically agreeing with each other. Um, you know, it's, I think it would be good to have as solid a beta as possible uh, as a kind of sustainability point, really. You know, here's, here's what it would look like. Um, here's work that was begun in 2018, which is now brought to some kind of usable state of completion. Um, but not, you know, here is, a, here is a requirement or something that we expect existing publishers to implement. So I think what might be helpful, um, and I think maybe this is a sustainability thing, and um, I guess I'm kind of saying this partly because I know Izzy's here representing kind of the broader piece as well, but I know, Tim, you're definitely involved in that from Open Active's kind of leadership mm -hmm. position. Um, having very clear theory of change that articulates why it is that we have the specs we have, the adopted model that we have in terms of, you know, lack of API keys, the reason that we push open first, the reason the EMD did what they did, the reason all these things have happened, for sustainability to make sure that we don't have a situation where in 2021 or two or three, someone says, oh, hang on, why don't we do this? And forgets the reasons that this is all built in the first place, because I guess there's been, there's been lots of um, grounds fought for here in terms of open for the sector that I think could be, is always going to be under challenge from anonymous or not organizations that want to get a piece of the pie somewhere by, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I have an idea about who you might be talking about, actually, and I can imagine some of those organizations and what they might be thinking about. And, and, and yeah, I, I think there's always going to be that challenge because anyone looking at this will think, well, how can I commercially squeeze something out of it? I know I'll be the only one that doesn't do open in this game of people who are all trying to do open and they'll be the suckers because I'll be the one doing the closed stuff. And that's, that's always the case. There's always going to be someone who tries to be closed in an open market in order to leverage some kind of advantage. And so it's almost just how do we make sure that we cement this in a way that we can't later on get strategically undone and undermine all the good work that's happened here because kind of the information left the building, if you like, and then the new people come in and go, I don't know, what, what, why have we got open licenses on this stuff? Like, ah, oh, these open feed endpoints, we just put API keys on them, just get them to charge whatever they want, that's fine. You know, and then slowly but surely it all kind of winds back. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's... I think that's a separate question of what the API actually should do on the harvester. Um, I, you know, I think, I think that's right. It's something for sustainability to consider um, and something for, you know, the open data Institute to consider. Absolutely. Um, but that said, there needs to be some kind of query interface on the harvester and it makes sense to have it in a robust kind of way. Um, and so, there, there's another there's another call scheduled for this discussion, so uh, I guess we can get down to the nitty gritty. I'm conscious we've got exactly one minute left, um, and that Nick and I have been talking for almost exactly 29 and a half of of <laughs> each of that. Um, so sorry, uh, Charlie, Chris, Tom, um, <laughs> any thoughts you'd like to share, or was that just painful? I I feel less smart. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> So thank you for that. Yeah, great. <laughs> that was interesting. Yeah, I just uh, had a bag of popcorn while watching the debate. <laughs> Who needs Wimbledon? Exactly. <laughs> but Nick, just to like, we will try, we will, like, obviously, the principles of open are absolutely fundamental to how we make sure that what we have created doesn't kind of, as you say, disintegrate before our eyes, like, and as part of the sustainability work, like how we make sure that this continues as open and not just continues 
but there's loads of money in API keys or whatever else, magical locks and whatever else with it um, in the way um, will be like a key consideration. So um, yeah, although we haven't maybe answered that today, I think it's it's definitely something we want to make sure that that is con is continued because the whole reason Sport England has invested in it is because it's open. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not the whole reason because, but it's, it's like a key a key like facet of that is the openness is is one of the key things we want to make sure continues. Just to reassure. <laughs> Okay, I think on that on that good note, uh, I will thank everybody. I'm glad we were uh, at least entertaining, um, and uh, I'll see you all um, two weeks hence when I believe the schedule is the scheduled uh, topic is the data set site specification. So that's going to be um, pretty meaty. Uh, have your have your technical hats on. Okay.